let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. been faithful through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and i know and i know you will do them again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things you will do great things so here of heaven conquer the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great
bless you guys. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good to see you all. Um, my name is Scott, and I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at SBC. I am Amy, and I am the Kids Co-Director. And we've got just a couple of connecting points for you guys. First off, if you're new, we're so glad you're hanging out with us this morning. We'd love to get, you know, get to know you some more and get you connected. So in your seat back in front of you is a connect card. If you grab that and fill out your information, drop it in the tithe box, we'll reach out to you, grab a burrito or coffee, and help you get connected here at SBC. Or better yet, since you're here now, we're going to have food trucks after the service out front. So come hang with us, introduce yourself, and grab some food from one of the food trucks and enjoy hanging out and getting to know some folks and do that as well. And then one other connecting opportunity, especially for you ladies, we're going to have a paint night on March 25th so uh, ladies can come together and, and paint stuff, I guess. I don't know. Sounds like it's going to be awesome. Um, but seriously, you should totally check it out. And if you're interested in doing that, go to the connections table afterwards and sign up and let them know. And we'll also have it on the Church Center app here soon. That way they know how much paint supplies to get and all that sort of stuff. So it's a great way for you ladies to, to get connected and hang out with one another. Um, I want to highlight something that happened here over this past weekend. This past Friday and Saturday, we had our first ever Christian sexuality class. And we had, I think, 33 people, folks, or folks show up on Friday night and Saturday morning to talk about what it looks like to pursue Jesus with our sexuality in the midst of a, just a vastly broken world. Um, and there was a lot of really good, hard, awkward, encouraging conversations. And that's what it really was, was the start of a conversation for us as a church, as, as in ways to kind of honor God with our sexuality and walk with him in that. And so if, you, if that perks your interest, we're going to do it again at some point in time. And so be listening for that. And you can sign up for that class. We'll let you know when, it, when it's going to be coming up. Um, one of the things I've been doing a lot recently is reading about kids and student ministries. And I was reading something this last week, and a statistic just kind of blew me away. There was a study done in 2019 that said 66% of kids who grow up in the church will leave the church when they graduate high school. 66% of them are, are going to walk away from the church or have walked away from the church historically. But of those that stayed, there's a couple of key contributing factors. And one of the biggest ones was that they had relationships with other adults in the church other than their parents, right? So they had other adults that they could go to that they could trust in the church, and that was a major contributing factor to the kids that stuck around and hung out in church. And so as a result of that, just throwing that there, um, there's a huge need for us for people to serve in Kids Co. and to partner with student ministry. And so Amy's going to talk a little bit about what it looks like to serve in kids ministry. Yeah, so it seems like every Sunday we've had new kids coming into Kids Co., which is absolutely amazing. But with that, that means that there's just a little bit more of a need for some help back there. So just some areas where we are seeing a need is just with our regular teachers or even class partners, if you just kind of want to come in, see what we're doing, just be a helper in the room. Um, we'd love to be able to have that. Um, we even have check-in. If you're like, do not put me in a room with kids, um, we have check-in people to help out as well that are just kind of a friendly face to get everyone checked in and where they need to go. And then a new position that we're seeing a need for is just, we're calling it a roamer. Um, someone that's here first and second service just once Sunday a month just to kind of be um, someone that can be like, hey, we need some extra help in twos and threes. Hey, we need some extra help in kindergarten, whatever it may be, just someone there that's there for us to plug in wherever we see the need that Sunday. Um, so if you're interested in any of those positions or just how you can help in Kids Co., let me know. You can send me an email. My email is probably the easiest one on staff. It's amy at sangerbible.com. Um, or you can come find me after service, and I'd love to chat with you as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, like I was saying, it truly takes a village to raise and disciple kids, right? So I'll make a deal with y'all. If you guys would be willing to be one of those adults that my kids can come talk to when they don't want to talk to me, I'll be one of those adults that your kids can come talk to when they need to talk to someone, okay? So let's really have this vision of raising and discipling our kids and students together. And then speaking of students, one of the best ways that they can interact with and get to know other adults and adult leaders is camp. Right? They get to go hang out for a week or whatever at camp with their leaders and really build those relationships. And so we're going to send our middle schoolers and high schoolers to camp this summer. We're super excited about that, but it costs money. And so we're doing a little fundraiser called Prank Wars. You might have heard about it. Um, essentially, if you haven't, you can buy 
various pranks to prank other people who are members of SBC. And if, the, if that worries you, don't worry, because you can buy insurance if you don't want to get pranked, which will also support the kids to go to camp at SBC. So if you want more information about that, go to the Church Center app or go to the Connections table. They can get you hooked up with that. But I'd encourage you to support our students and their leaders in that as well. And then this upcoming Saturday, we are having the car show and Lego competition. The car show will be out in the parking lot. And then the Lego competition will be in the sanctuary. And we're going to use some of the rooms to have just some Lego activities going on. So that's this Saturday. Um, we are in need of volunteers for this. There is an opportunity to serve with the car show from 5.30 to 9.30 a.m. And then when we're doing something in here, we also need some help in the rooms and um, just kind of having the activities go on. So if you're interested, you can sign up on the Church Center app um, for either one of those two places. Awesome. Yeah, and if you don't know what the Church Center app is, you can also go to the Connections table. They can help you figure out how to get that on your phone. Okay, so that's a, a lot of stuff, a lot of really cool stuff going on. But as we enter back into a time of worship through music, I don't know how your week was, but oftentimes I come in here with all sorts of things running through my mind and just been kind of frantic. And so I'd encourage you guys to take this next song as an opportunity to really center and focus your hearts and minds on Jesus and prepare yourself uh, for what we're going to learn through his word and teaching as, as Pete brings a sermon this morning. So let me, let me pray for us, and then we'll hop back in. Uh, Lord, we're so grateful for your grace uh, and love for us, for your son who um, was born, lived, died, and was resurrected on our behalf. And we pray that that would be our, our focus and we look to and pursue today. And as we leave here today, that we would be transformed to go be the church and live on mission uh, and be the hands and feet of Jesus and talk to others about you. And uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, guys, we're going to sing a song. We haven't really sung much here, but Timeless Hymn called There is a Fountain. Just great, great lyrics. Just talk about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Kind of our response in the last verse and how we're going to continue to praise his name no matter the circumstances in life and death. So keep that in mind, guys, as we sing this song.
lisping, stammering tongue, my silent in the Father, we sing to you, to sing to your Son. We make much of him and him alone. We pray this in your name. Amen. Matthew chapter 15, verse 29 through 39. Matthew chapter 15, verse 29 through 39. We're going to do something a little different this morning. I want to read the whole text. First, before we go back and dive into a verse-by-verse expository of the text. Matthew 15, verse 29. Jesus went on from there, and he walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And he went up the mountain, and he sat down. And the crowds came to him, bringing with him the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put put them at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered, and when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, the blind seeing, the glory, they glorified God, the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on this crowd because they have been with me now three days. I have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we going to get enough food? Where are we going to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, having given thanks and broke them, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took them up, and they took up seven baskets full of broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men, besides the women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into a boat and went away, went to the region of Magadan. The compassion word in Hebrew and Greek means to have mercy, to feel sympathy. To have pity. Psalm 86 verse 15 says that God is compassionate. He is gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithful. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 and 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is 
your faithfulness. When Jesus walked this earth, he walked with compassion. When Jesus saw his friends weeping at the grave of Lazarus, he felt compassion for them and he wept along them. When Jesus saw the large crowds following him, he was moved with compassion. Jesus healed and and fed the large crowds. When he saw the demon-possessed man, his, his compassion led him to heal him. When God saw sin enter this earth, because of his compassion, God promised that he'll take care of all of this. And God became flesh and walked this earth having compassion on everyone. Last week, we saw the Canaanite woman who, by faith, begged Jesus, hey, can you heal my demon-possessed daughter? And then after this unique conversation, Jesus was drawing out her faith. She pretty much tells Jesus, Jesus, I'll take the crumbs. I'll take the crumbs of your grace and mercy. I know your leftovers of grace and mercy are so much more powerful. They will heal my daughter. Jesus shows her compassion and heals her daughter. Today, again in our text, Jesus is going to have compassion. Now, as we read the text already in verses 29 through 39, some of us were probably thinking, hey, didn't we teach this a couple weeks ago? You're correct. But that was Matthew 14, verse 13 through 21. Today is Matthew 15, verse 29 through 39. And so is it the same story? No, it's not the same story. It takes, a pla- it takes place in a different time, a different location, to a different crowd. Yet Jesus leads the same impossible miracle here. And so although it's a different time, location, and crowd, what we're going to see is it's the same lesson. Jesus is going to teach the disciples a lesson that I think we have lots of room to grow in, which is compassion. You see, right now, Christians don't have the best reputation Like in our society, where people think Christians are judgmental, critical, divisive. And honestly, a lot of ways, I I agree, generalizing among just Christianity as a whole, I agree. We have said things from our mouths. We have posted stuff on our social media. We have raised flags and slapped stickers on our cars that really show that we have a critical, judgmental heart. And so what we're going to see today is that we are just like the disciples. When there's a need, what Jesus feels is compassion, whereas the disciples, when there's a need, they're trying to get rid of it. What we're going to see is we're just like them. Matthew chapter 15. Let's look at verse 29. Let's go through it verse by verse. Uh, before we start, welcome to Sanger Bible. My name is Pete. I'm glad we're hanging out here today. There is uh, folks watching live. Hello to everybody watching live. Um, I realized I didn't introduce myself, and so I'm glad we get to hang out here. So verse 29 is where we will begin. Jesus went from there, and he walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the side of the, and he went up on the mountain, and he sat down there. And so after Jesus and the disciples, they had been trying to get some rest. And so after he's gotten some rest, he walks by the Sea of Galilee and he sits on the side of the mountain. What's interesting is in Mark's gospel account, it says this in Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Again, he went from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. So Jesus is in a Greek Gentile city. He's in the, 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 uh, the Decapolis. De- Deca means 10 and P- polis means city. So there's a region of 10 Gentile cities. This is where Jesus is at. He's on the side of a mountain there. Look at verse 30. It says, And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and Jesus healed them. So Gentiles, so remember, Jesus is no longer in Israel territory. He's, a, he's around Gentiles, these 10 cities, and they bring their sick to Jesus. They know that Jesus heals. For some reason, they understand what Jesus does. And so what do they do? They bring their sick to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Having compassion on them, he heals them. He heals them. How did they know to bring their sick 
to Jesus. Like, how do they know that they got to bring their loved ones and, and their, the ones with physical disabilities? How do they know they should bring Je- these po- people to Jesus? How do they know Jesus had power? Last week, after last week's um, sermon, I got an email, and the email said, Hey, Pete, how did the Canaanite woman, who's a Gentile, how did she know that Jesus is Lord? How did she know that Jesus could, could save her demon possessed daughter? Remember, Jesus is no longer in Israel territory. He is now in Gentile land. Yet here comes this Gentile woman, and and, and she knows that he's Lord, and she begs, Lord, heal my daughter. And so I replied back. I said, hey, back in those days, people knew their history. They knew the history of, of, the, of Israel. And so they knew that Israel had a Messiah that's going to come, that is going to rule the land. So they knew that. And so I'm sure they've heard the stories of Jesus. They heard the story, the power that he has to heal. And so people were probably talking around. They said, hey, did you hear about this guy? You hear about this guy? But then going into today's text, I started to wonder, how did all the rest of these people know? Like, it seems like the the the... The news got around pretty quick, right? How did they know? In Mark's gospel, the word decapolis is used twice. It's used in the very story that we're hearing right now, the feeding of the 4,000. But it's also used back when Jesus healed the demon-possessed man. You guys remember that? The two demon-possessed men, they came and ran to Jesus, and they were like, you know, Jesus has this conversation, and then Jesus cast out the demons out of these two men into a herd of pigs, and in that herd of pigs, what happens is those herd of pigs runs, and they go off the cliff, and they die, right? And then there's two things that happen there. The herdsmen, they see what's happening. The herdsmen run to the town, and they're like, dude, there's a crazy guy that's healing demon-possessed men. He killed all of our pigs, all of our money. The other thing that happened is one of those demon-possessed men come to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, I want to go with you. So Jesus and the disciples are getting into the boat. They're like, Jesus, I want to go with you. And so you would think Jesus will look over and be like, hey, Peter, move over. You know, homeboy's coming with us, right? No, he doesn't say that. This is what Jesus says to him in Mark chapter 5, verse 19 through 20. He said, he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Verse 20, this is what it says. And he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Jesus tells his man, hey, go and tell everyone in the Decapolis. Go tell your family and your friends what I have done for you, what the Lord has done for you. Could this be how the Canaanite woman heard about Jesus? Could this be how everybody in the Decapolis, in this Gentile region, is this how that they heard about Jesus as Lord? Because they see him and they're like, well, we're bringing out sick because he healed that weird demon-possessed guy. I don't know. But it seems to make sense, right? So before we move on, here's a, here's a side nugget that I want us to apply um, immediately. When it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to sharing Jesus, all Jesus asks of us is to share what he's done in our lives. That's it. All he wants us to do is to share what he has done in our lives. It's the same thing he told the demon-possessed guy. Go share what God has done in your life. Go tell your family and friends. Go tell everybody what I'm doing and what I am doing. There's no shame in that. Jesus didn't say, hey, I want you to go and get theologically trained. I want you to understand all this stuff before you tell everyone. No, he says, go share the gospel. How? By just telling your story. That nugget we should always be doing. We should always be sharing what God is doing in our lives. Whether we like it or not, always be sharing. Look at verse 31. So the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healing, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. 
So what happens is they respond to what God has been doing, to what Jesus has been doing. These Gentiles begin to worship Jesus. These, this Gentile crowd praise Jesus. They are the God of, of Israel. They, they, they praise him for he is the God of Israel. What's interesting is just in the beginning of chapter 15, you have Israel, people in Israel reject Jesus. Yet here, the people who are supposed to be on the outside, those who are supposed to be unclean, they see Jesus as Lord and they worship him as God of Israel. Look at verse 32. And then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days. I have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away, lest they faint on the way. So we'll get a little detail of what's going on here. It's been three days, so it's probably like a little retreat. Jesus has been healing people. He's, he's praising, and people are praising Jesus for what he's doing. So naturally, they've run out of food. Folks are getting hungry, and Jesus, being the host that he is, he wants to feed them. But you notice what he does. He doesn't say, hey, disciples, we're going to feed him. This is what we're going to do. He doesn't take control. You notice that he brings their attention. He comes and say, hey, man, I want to feed him. I want to do something. I have compassion on them. They look hungry. I wonder if Jesus was trying to get them in on the plan, was trying to get them to see, hey, I wonder if they learned that I just fed 5,000 people. I wonder if they learned here the same thing. And so Jesus calls them in. And he tells them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days. They have nothing to eat. And so you'll think they would be like, dude, we just fed 5,000. Jesus, let's do that. that. Can can we do the same thing? We just fed the 5,000. There's only 4,000 here. Let's just do that. You'll think that's what they say. Look at verse 33. And the disciples said to him, where are we going to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? Man, how quick have the disciples forgotten what just happened? Like literally, like a couple weeks ago, a handful of days maybe, they were involved in the greatest miracle, feeding the 5,000. Yet here, they're already questioning God. They're already questioning Jesus. Where are we going to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed the great crowd? What the disciples are doing is they're showing that they they didn't even learn from the 5,000. They didn't learn. In fact, I would say it's almost like a complaint. The question of Jesus is, feels like a complaint. Jesus tells them, I have compassion on them. My heart hurts for these people. I want to do something. And the disciples not seeing what they see, they lack compassion. Church, for some time now, generalizing, when I look over just the Christianity as a whole here in the United States, compassion among Christians have been absent. Compassion among Christians is really hard to find. Just talking to people at Starbucks who I know for a fact are not Christians. When I say, hey, when, you, when I say Christians, what do you think about? It was judgmental, arrogant, stuck up. And when I look out into the world and, and, and I see Christians, for some reason, everything that we're saying feels and looks like it's, it's criticism. It's judgmental. It's not compassion. And so instead of leaning in into the situations in this world with with care and love and compassion, man, we are so quick to offer our opinion. We're so quick to to offer up our, our questions and excuses, which is really trying to hide us from actually leaning in, just like the disciples. And so let's say something happens, and so instead of having compassion, we say, well, what do they do to get in that situation? That's on them. Right? Or I have done this. I have a cousin who passed away in LA. He was in his 80s, passed away from COVID. Literally, I get the phone call and I get off. I call my mom and say, Mom, like, what happened? The second thing that comes out of my mouth is like, oh, 
I didn't say, oh, that's sad or anything. I said this. Did they have any underlining conditions? No compassion. Like as, as if that question, like, may also, well, see? It's because he was a smoker. No compassion came out of my mouth. And honestly, this is what I've heard from, from Christianity just for the, in, in the last two years. We have been so critical and not compassionate. Our hearts have just hardened towards people. Our hearts have just gotten so isolated and exclusive. And so what we've done is we, we have retreated to, to hanging out with people that think like us and, and we, we like and we're comfortable with. And that, what that does is it takes us away and then it's easy to become critical. Because how, how can we care for people when, well, when we're not with them? Like how can we have compassion when we never see them? And so as I look at this text and I hear the disciples say this, I, I, I'm truly, honest, like we, we look more like the disciples right now. Instead of seeing the people in need and having compassion, we're seeing them and just like, well, trying to come up with excuses. And so Jesus sees this heart. Jesus sees this, this lack of compassion. And so what does he do? He goes on to teach him. He doesn't, he doesn't like, you have to yell at them. He doesn't do anything. He just says, well, how many loaves do you have? And so they said seven and a few small fish. Look at verse 35. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish. And having given thanks, he broke them and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples did the same thing that they did with the 5,000. They just continued to give out and hand food. In verse 37, they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And so the feeding of this 4,000 is, is the same as carried out that, was, that happened in the 5,000. Here, though, they actually begin with more food but with fewer people. Still, though, it's an impossible feat to feed 4,000 people, and it's still a miracle. And the same thing, this miracle cannot have happened without Jesus. Jesus intervenes, he gets the food, he blesses it, and he hands it to the disciples, and he goes, serve and as they're serving, what happens is it's just being multiplied, 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 and multiplied. Verse 38 says, Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and he went to the region of Magadan. Jesus here shows his unlimited power and resources. Jesus here shows that because he is Lord, he's able to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, to whomever he wants, and as often as he wants. And because of his love and because of his compassion, what he does is people bring their sick to him and he heals them. Because of his love and because of his compassion, he sees that there's a need, an immediate need, and that is their hunger. They're hungry, and so what does he do? He meets their need and he feeds them. And from that compassion, what, be, what continues to be multiplied because of his love and compassion, Jesus will then later go on to carry the cross. And because of his compassion, Jesus will later on and be mocked and beaten. And because of the cross, Jesus later on will die on the cross. Church, there's, there's so many applications we can pull from, from this story. Like we, we can talk about that Jesus is here for all of us, not just the Jews. He's here for Jews and the Gentiles, all of us. We can talk about how Jesus' resources are unlimited. Over and over and over again, we've seen his power, him walking on water, him healing the sick. We, totally, we can totally take that as an, and apply like Jesus has unlimited power. We can also talk about here how Jesus is to be praised. Like in response to what Jesus has done in our lives, we are to praise and worship him. And when I say praise and worship, I'm not talking about music only. I'm talking about like our lives outside the church. Everything is to be praised and worthy, uh, worship to Jesus. 
Those are all solid application points. But what I want us to take away here is what Jesus is teaching the disciples. Compassion. You see, as followers of Jesus, he expects us to follow his lead and to lead with compassion. Jesus could have easily stayed in Israel. He could have kept his, his kingdom to Israel. But what does Jesus do? He, he leaves and he goes to Decapolis. He, he leaves and he goes to them. He leaves and he goes to the outsiders. He goes to the people who have different values, the people who are outward sinners, the people who have voted different. Jesus goes to them and he expects the same from us. He desires us to, to go to those that nobody loves. He desires us to go to the places where we feel uncomfortable. That's what he expects from us. James chapter 1 verse 22 tells us that we are to prove ourselves to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. Years ago when my dad uh, was 10 years old back in Tonga, uh, his father died. And so at 10 years old, he kind of just became this, uh, how, do, how do you describe it? He just, he was one of the worst kids around. Got kicked out of schools over and over again. But every Sunday, he would always show up to church. And every Sunday, he always had the same Sunday school teacher. And so just to give you a little idea about my dad, my dad once fought a whole high school. Walked on the campus and he said, bring it on. And he just started fighting until the principal got him and took him out. So that, this is the kind of life my dad was lived. But every Sunday, he would always go to Sunday school. And at Sunday school, there was a teacher there that kept on showing him compassion. Say, it's okay, Sifa. How? means come. I love you. Compassion, compassion, compassion. When my dad went to New Zealand there, he gave his life to Christ and he became a minister and still is a minister today. But in 2002, we took our first uh, mission trip back to Tonga. And you land on the main island and then you get on a little tiny plane that can only fit like 10 people to go to my dad's island. When they arrive at my dad's island... And so news, everybody knows at that time that my dad has, is a believer now and he's doing all these great things as a pastor. When they arrive at my dad's island, they see this old lady, 80 years old, dancing on the tarmac. And so when you think of like tarmac, it's, what, Tonga is not like LAX. This is like where everybody can just walk on the, on the tarmac. They pull it, they land, and there's this lady dancing on the tarmac. Like, what's going on here? They're like, see, hey, what this lady dancing, old lady just dancing. My dad looks out. He's like, that's my Sunday school teacher. You see, when he got out, he had this, he, he hugged her, and all she could say is like, praise God. Praise God. You see, the compassion that we are to show, no matter how, we, how people respond to us, we are to show compassion no matter what. No matter what. We don't know how, how God's journey in people's lives are going to be. This woman, in the time when my dad didn't have a father, when my dad was just fighting and was just a hellion, she showed compassion, compassion, and compassion. And when she's in her 80s, my father's coming down on the plane. She was like, all I can do is dance with joy. Church, we, as a people, as God's people, ought to be the picture of compassion everywhere. And so here are three things that can help us uh, develop and, and grow to have a compassionate heart. Number one, get involved. Get involved. To get, get, it, it's hard to have empathy for someone when, when you're not with them. It's hard to, to, to care for others when you're, far, like, when you're far away. And so to have care and compassion for, for them, you, you got to get involved. You got to get in their space. You, you, you got to get around them in their, in, their, in their atmosphere. Go to them. 
Go and serve folks maybe that make you feel uncomfortable. In fact, do something where you got to rely on God. Get involved in their lives. You see, by you getting involved, you now are being incarnational like Jesus. You're not offering sympathies from afar. You're, you're getting involved. You're getting dirty. Moving into lives, developing relationships, and serving them. Number two, as you're getting involved, listen well. You see, compassion can come in many forms, but typically it doesn't come with many words. And so usually what happens is we want to get involved and we want to tell the person, hey, this is what you need to do. No, get involved and listen. Our goal should be to listen well. Our goal shouldn't be to prove a point or make sure our opinion is heard and expressed. Our goal is to to listen well. Third, as we get involved, as we listen, let's invite them in. You see, when the world, in, in our world today, it's easy to, to insulate ourselves in an echo chamber of opinions. It's easy to isolate ourselves. It's easy to, to be exclusive with, with our homies, you know? It's, it's like we, we go get involved, and then we go back. We go and listen, and then we we'll retreat back to what's comfortable for us. Man, but if we're supposed to go the extra mile, if we're supposed to do what Jesus wants us to do, we're supposed to go further, we're supposed to go get involved, listen, and then we're like, hey, come and do life with me. Come into my house. Come, I want to feed you. You see, we've gotten so comfortable that we invite folks, that, that we go to people or we send a check. I was like, oh, we're good. But what if we invited them in? What if we invited them in? You see, if you really want to grow in practice and grow in compassion, invite somebody in. And lastly, sorry, if I told you there's three, I actually have four. As we go get involved with others, as we go and listen to others, as we invite people in, remember, remember this. As we go and get involved, as we go and listen, as we go and invite people in, remember that this is what Jesus did for you and I. Like, he left heaven, he got involved on earth. When people are bringing their sick to Jesus, you know that they're telling their stories. They're like, Jesus, this is my little boy. He likes to run around the soccer ball, but his leg's messed up. You know they're telling their stories, and so they're, Jesus is listening. And then what Jesus does, the ultimate act of compassion, he goes to the cross. He dies on the cross, and he resurrects. And that right there, folks, is his invitation for us to come in to him. So as we go get involved, as we go and listen, as we invite people in, that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I. Let's remember this. Let's remember this. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Church, this is today's text for us. This is today's text for us. And so some of us are here right now and you're like, oh man, I have been critical. My spirit has criticism everywhere and so if that's you you need to confess you need to repent some of us are here right now and we're like oh man i haven't i've been selfish with my time if that's you you need to confess you need to repent and then there's some of us here who have never placed their faith in christ can i ask you to consider Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning? He left his comfortable throne to come and be born in this uncomfortable manger. He got involved in earth. And even though you, you're probably like, I don't, I'm cool. I'm, no, he got involved. And he's willing to listen. In fact, he invites you in to live a life that's no other. I hope you're here today because somebody showed you compassion. 
I hope you're, you're here today because somebody, just like my dad's uh, you know, Sunday school teacher, showed you a compassion because you're like, finally, I want to come because so-and-so, my friend, my mom, my neighbor showed me compassion. I hope you're here today because of that compassion. If you're here today just for some reason and it's not compassion, I am sorry for the, for the lack of compassion Christians are not showing you. Look to Jesus. Don't look at us. We mess up everything Jesus does. Look to Jesus. Let's pray. Everyone that is thirsty, Lord, everyone that is hungry, everyone that has a need, everyone that is spiritually dead, we know, Jesus, that it is only you and by your power that you can satisfy us. So Holy Spirit, move in this room. Those of us who need to confess and re- repent because we've just been selfish, bring clarity to us. Those of us who want to place their faith in Christ, Jesus, I pray that this is a, their moment today. Amen.
into darkness your mercy came you called me out you lifted me up how great is your love you bore my weakness you took my shame buried my burdens in fields of grace you called me out you lifted me up how great is your love from the heights of heaven you stepped down to earth innocent perfection Gave your life for us and we are amazed And we stand in awe For we have been changed by the power of the cross How great, how great, how great is your love How great, how great, how great is your love How great
uh, just so you guys know, as this week's prep went on, like if, if you guys would could see into my mind, I, I struggle with my judgmental thoughts. That's my, it's my struggle. And so as I'm saying being compassionate, I'm preaching to myself. And so as we go this morning, remember, get involved, listen, and invite people in because that's what Jesus did for us. So let's go be the church. Let's go be compassionate to everyone, everyone we see. Because you never know. That person you're compassionate to and towards may come to faith and you too will one day be dancing on the tarmac that Jesus saved them. Let's go be the church. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you guys outside with our food trucks. Enjoy.